Hey everyone, and welcome back to our weekly or somewhat weekly Rust, Orboot, and Risk V hacking streams. So today I want to actually shift gears once again a bit. So last time, if you recall, um, by the end of the stream, we looked into the vendor's DRAM init code for the JH7100 SOC, which is the one on the Vision 5 board uh, that we're working with. And so there is um, one issue now, which is uh, we have a reference implementation written in C, and we could technically or potentially include that in our Rust code. However, we've also seen that there is quite a lot of additional stuff um, that we actually don't really want. And so there are now a few other possibilities. So one is uh, that we just uh, walk through and reduce the code a bit so that it really just boils down to what we actually need. So the actual DRAM in it. And then see if we can call into that from our Rust code. Or, and that is what I would actually like to do today, uh, let's look at the feasibility of just rewriting the C code in Rust that is initializing this DRAM here. Um, so first of all, uh, yeah, let's see what I have here now. So currently I have my terminal open. Uh, I just powered on the board and um, j then just uh, held reset and uh, put it in the bootloader mode again. And we see the output that we already had from our own Rust code, right? So yeah, this year was essentially already a replacement uh, for the very first stage uh, of the vendor code. And now this year is coming from the DRAM in it. And so, yeah, as you can see, um, there is some information on the DRAM. So there is a version being printed here. That's like the version of the repository, including a timestamp. So that's the build date. And then here, I think this should be the, um, like the commit hash of the Git repository. Uh, on the other hand, we also see the DRAM clock. And we also see a bit of a test here. So I guess it's like uh, testing one megabyte here, another megabyte here, uh, or something like that. And, you know, just probably just writing a pattern to DRAM, trying to read it back and see, you know, if it's uh, just what's expected. So we've uh, also done this in uh, another port in Orboot uh, for the D1 SOC. Um, so yeah, we're, we're just writing a random pattern and then reading it back. Oh, and hello and welcome to the stream. Uh, unique Jan. Hey, Jan. So yeah. Um, just two uh, real quick things today uh, before we dive into this. So number one, um, we had drawn a bit of a sketch of uh, how we were uh, transitioning from the vendor code to our Rust code uh, step by step. And I had drawn a sketch in uh, Draw.io um, and well, I just reworked that a slight little bit so uh, that it's a bit um, more fitting to what we're currently doing. Uh, and also a bit nicer to look at. So let's uh, open this here. Um, so yeah, if you recall, this is exactly what I was sketching, but it's a bit more colorful now. I put some emoji in here um, and I, I, I reworked uh, the um, different steps here. So let's quickly walk through. So on the left hand side here, um, this is essentially a subset of the memory map that we have. So we, we have some SRAM banks here, 128K each. And then we have a large DRAM part. That's the part that we need to initialize, actually. Uh, well, what the vendor code is already doing, but you know, we would actually like to do that under our own control uh, and then just continue execution from there. And so if we look at this here, that was the initial flow. So we always start with the mask room. The mask room is somehow memory mapped somewhere. This is just where, you know, we cannot actually do anything because this is like baked into the chip, right? So we cannot change that part. Now, initially the vendor had something, they call it second boot. And when they say second, it means they start counting from the mask room. But from the, um, from the software perspective, this is actually the first uh, part that is uh, you know, just writable for us. Well, and uh, that's what we already replaced with our boot. And in our boot, we just call it boot zero currently because we start counting at zero. It doesn't really matter. It's just uh, important to know how things map to each other. Well, uh, they continued with the DRAM in it, handing over to OpenSBI. 
and then you boot, right? And this is also the part that we retained so far. So essentially we really just swapped out this very first stage. Now what we want to do in the next stage, and this is where we have a second crab emoji here, because it's like the second thing we replaced with Rust. Uh, we just add our own DRAM init code or include that one. It doesn't really matter right now, uh, but it means that you know we have more under our control. And then again, we just continue with um, the existing open SBI and then U-boot. And then in the next step again, uh, we also include SBI in our code, but instead of open SBI, which is written in C and again, external code, so it's a bit harder to include and stuff, uh, we just write our own and then we also tailor it uh, for our needs. And that's the REST SBI project that we're using. We already had a brief look into that in one of the streams. Um, and so the point would be to you know fill that with life. So uh, previously we, we had thought we might do this earlier before uh, you know getting uh, to this part here. So essentially we, we, we could also remain here and then only replace the open SBI part, right? So technically that would also have worked. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm suggesting this path now with a slightly different transition. Well, and eventually we want to re uh, replace U-boot with Linux boot uh, because that's also a bit of a nicer environment for us to work with. Like in, in U-boot, if we uh, want to you know, have our own bootloader and stuff like that, uh, it, it's a bit harder to adjust. So in Linux boot, we just write a small Linux application and that's a very, very easy environment to work with. Uh, not only because I also have it, for example, running on my uh, host, right? So my host operating system here is also Linux. So it's actually very easy to write those tools. Um, but also because we can uh, write this here in, in any language and it's it's very, very simple to do, right? So like I can, I can say I write something in Rust, for example, or in Go, which is uh, what most tools are currently written in, which are made for Linux boot. So yeah, let's close that for now. Um, now, uh, I want to look at something else very briefly. I forgot to mention that. Um, there is now an Indiegogo campaign running. Uh, let's see if we can zoom in a bit. Uh, this is from Cyped, and Cyped are making, you know, like uh, small development boards, uh, many different ones. And they also made a bunch of D1 boards, of which I also own quite a bunch. Uh, that's what I mainly worked with when I was working with the D1 SLC. And now they uh, are offering a new one, uh, which is based on the Buffalo Lab uh, BL808, which is essentially uh, very similar to the D1 um, because it's based on the same RISC-V core, but it has two additional RISC-V cores. So there is one which is the uh, main uh, application core. That's a 64-bit core, the C906, C906 by, by T-Hat. So that's like Alibaba Semiconductor um, department or daughter company, whatever. Uh, and this one here has two additional uh, so-called E cores or uh, embedded cores. Um, they are a bit more reduced, so they are not 64, but they are 32-bit. Uh, and they're just alongside the application core. So I haven't looked too much into detail for now uh, because the campaign just recently started, uh, but I've ordered a bunch of those boards and they should also arrive at some point. And that will also make a very nice target for our boot. Uh, and if you look down here, uh, there are very nice ports. So one is, you know, a yard that you have directly available. Another one is called OTG. Um, yeah. I, I have a suspicion that this is also how you can talk to the mask from here, or if not, there is also uh, an extra debugger available that just you know um, goes into the uh, into the SD card slot, uh, which you currently don't see here. Um, but yeah, you can scroll down a bit here. Uh, here's a larger picture, and I think at the back. Uh, so this is just uh, the sum, the module that is essentially what is under. Uh, under the shield here, right? So it's like the same thing, but without the shield. Um, and then here is also, ah, look, here is a rotating view. And here you can see, uh, yeah, this is the module. And the back is sort of covered now by, <laughs> by a, a small screen here. So they also offer a case and stuff. 
Um, yeah, and that's also where the SD card reader is sitting. It's a, it's a bit hard to see here right now. Maybe if we scroll down a bit more. Uh, yeah, do not get confused. This is a uh, different board that is also offered in the same campaign, but this is like just a small microcontroller. Um, it's quite a lengthy uh, page, to be honest. It's a bit hard to navigate. Uh, you can really just like scroll forever. You got the perks here on the side. Um, right. Here we go. So these are the different perks. And do we already get the right here? So this here is the debug board. And as you can see, it looks a bit like an SD card already. Um, that plugs into the back of this one here. Yeah. I don't know, maybe it's uh, visible at some point in one of the videos here. So I don't want to actually wait for the uh, videos to loop too much. Um, yeah. Anyway, will be a very, very interesting target. Yeah, we'll put that link in the show notes again. All right. And now let's come back to our code again. So the, uh, or <laughs> rather the vendors, the DRAM in it is what we also looked at briefly last time. So we looked at the boot directory and the DDR in it. And there is a file called start.s, which is really where the actual execution starts. So this is what's calling into the C code, which is starting here in boot main.c. And that again uh, would import a lot of more code. So there is uh, this here, for example, this directory, DDR file configuration, and then there is DDRC configuration. And then there is a bunch more stuff uh, which we really are not going to need, like SDIO, for example. So we're not gonna, you know, <laughs> we're not gonna talk to an SD card at this stage. We really just want to bring up the DRAM, nothing else. So yeah, that, that would be uh, somewhere else in the code then. Um, so yeah, uh, let's reopen the start.s file and let's see uh, how it jumps to the main uh, function again which is in the C code, which is not called main, but it's called slightly different. Um, hang on, so here is clearing the section there. It's called boot main here, right? So if we want to find boot main, we need to look at the boot main.c file. And so here we find a function that is called boot main, and this is like the actual entry point. So what we have in the S file, that's really just assembly code uh, that, that's just preparing the execution environment. So, yeah. And now the question is, how is the DRAM actually being configured? So here you can already see, there are some if defined uh, statements here. So you can see the print case. And if we look at the information that we got here, we're seeing DDR clock 2133 megabytes or, or megabits, I guess. Um, and that is, a, or megahertz, actually. Uh, that is what we see here, right? So uh, let's drop a little note here. We are doing this. Uh, lots of exclamation marks. Well, and then the execution starts like this. So yeah, we're, we're now taking this branch again. Now there is something else. Uh, this here, init, ndb, whatever. Um, that is not applicable to us, so not applicable. And then again, it continues um, with this year. So yeah, it, it does this before uh, boot from chip link and then boot mode. And there it would determine uh, how to continue the execution. But we're actually not interested in that at all. We just want to see the um, initialization of the DRAM. So that's what we're going to look for now. And uh, well, the question is, um, why isn't there like a function call to like do the DRAM initialization? So let's see what we have here. So we have boot from chip link, whatever that is. Uh, where do we find that? It's here within the code. I just jumped to that. And it looks like there is something about the delay here. Uh, there is something about spy flash here, which is really not important in our case. Um, and then there is this boot delay thing here. And 
I would guess that's exactly what we see here. So this here is counting down. If I just hit reset again, we see that. So it says like two, one, zero, and then it starts, uh, or it just continues. Um, yeah, I just put re uh, press reset again, uh, so it won't continue. It looks somehow like this here. Um, it wouldn't make sense. So there is like a percent D here, so that's a number, uh, followed by a space. And before that is three, uh, I don't actually know what backslash B would be. Um, it could be like backspace. So it's like, it's printing the number, it's printing space, uh, potentially something else. <laughs> and then when it's printing again, it's printing backspace, 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 and again, a number, space. Oh, there is actually no something else. I guess they just added a third backspace here. Um, yeah, which is interesting. But yeah, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, now let's see if we look at this. Uh, the DRAM test has already been printed, right? So we, we already got this part here. So, and that was even before that thing. So let's see, I guess we just missed something in the execution flow. So let's scroll up again. Oh, and here we go. So yeah. This is the actual code that we want, init.ddr. Everything else is not really important to us. We don't want to continue with uh, anything. We would just do it in our code. Now the question is, um, where do we find this init.ddr? And so let's keep this here in mind. Um, we're looking for ddr2133 at some point. Uh, so let's see where we find this. Uh-huh. So look, um, once again, we have the DDR2133. So we can say we are here. Let's actually put node here. Um, yeah, I currently don't have syntax highlighting for that, but yeah, it doesn't really matter. We also get Vimoji. So yeah, I see where I'm changing a line. <laughs> All right. So now the question is, can we translate this part of the code to C very easy, uh, to rest very easy. So if we look at this, uh, just scrolling down a bit, it's actually really just mostly simple functions. And then there is this stuff here. And that could be the DRAM test. But look, here we have DDR, OX, and so on, and count. And that looks very much like this here. So yeah, uh, we, we have this one giant function here. It's like, I don't know, some, some 200 lines or something. Um, but that's actually not everything. So it's also calling into other functions again, uh, which we will need to look at. Like this one, for example. So uh, that looks like a macro somehow. So we need to figure out what that is. Um, let's actually have a quick wrap for that. So yeah, if we look at that, uh, here we have the uh, clock control macros. So it's, it's really just uh, this simple function. Um, yeah, let's open that in a split view. And well, you can see this is like all the register definitions and stuff like that. And uh, we're looking for, we're looking for, what was it? this here. So yeah, it's down here. As you can see, it's, it's really just a, a shorthand for doing this here. And that in turn, once again, is calling into other functions. And if you recall um, some of the code that we uh, took earlier and just refactored, it's very similar. So it looks like a read, modify, and write back, right? So it's like in W, it's reading a word. And then here it's out w, it's just outputting a word again. So without knowing the specific implementation of those two functions, so it's just helper functions in a way. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very easy to spot this pattern once you know it. Actually, we can uh, see if we can find this uh, somewhere. It's probably coming from another header file or something. So uh, it could be something that is used elsewhere. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I don't want to um, waste too much time on this here right now. It's just always good to know like when there is helper functions called, uh, that it's actually not something huge. 
Now you see there is also uh, a bunch of these here, which are similar. So it's also this uh, MA out word or out W something. Um, so yeah, it's writing some sort of magic values here. So here it says like set reset and clear reset. Um, but if you look closely, it looks like for each of those implementations here, it's writing to the same register, this one here, SCFG PLL1, uh, whatever that is in uh, particular, but it's writing different values. Like here for doing the reset, it's writing a hex 2929 something, and here it's 3737 something. So yeah, it looks like uh, there is some additional uh, logic behind that. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, what we will just do is we, we will just uh, do the same essentially so that it's, um, you know, easier for us. Oh, and look at this here. It looks like we actually got an explanation here. So it looks like uh, the first byte is, I don't know, they're writing OD. That could be like open drain or something. I have no clue. Uh, BWADG adjust something maybe. Um, clock frequency divider, likely. CLKR, clock something, maybe clock reset, I don't know. Bypass, I don't know what it should be bypassing. There is a reset right here in the back. And inf B, I don't know what inf B would be. There is something called InfiniBand, but I don't know if that is related. And there is PD, um, I don't know what that would be. Anyway, uh, but it, it's good to have a bit of an explanation here. So yeah, um, what we can actually do is, uh, we can essentially uh, just take all of these function calls and copy them into our Rust code now. Uh, but I want to get a bit more of an understanding here right now. So how does it work? So first it's setting up some clocks and doing some reset something. So this here is also like clock, clock something. That's okay. So it's also rather straightforward, right? So when you uh, like, when you set up uh, peripherals and stuff, you always need some uh, clocks somehow. And well, then you do the specific setup. Uh, th that is very natural. So you have that in like all sorts of MCUs and SLCs and stuff. Um, and now here is the uh, more juicy part, let's say. so. When it's configuring the DDR5, phi, phi zero in this case, I guess there is only one anyway. Um, or is there? Well, it could be that there are multiple ones. So yeah, it's, it's looping through like, okay, this is like a, a, I call that a stupid loop. So if you look at that, it's like DDR num equals zero as long as as long as it's below two, we're increasing, so incrementing here. So um, <laughs> we, we could also just do two steps individually. It's like no value to have that loop here. Um, yeah, it, it just looks a bit weird. So it looks like there is like some, some very fancy control flow going on here, <laughs> but it's really just executing twice. So yeah, I don't know. Um, we could just write this year and then this year would be the same thing, at least from uh, what I can see right now. And if we look at that, <laughs> it's, it's even just here, it's writing config zero here. It's writing config one. Amazing. I don't know why p people sometimes do this here, but I've seen this before. It's just a bit strange. Um, well. I guess it has some meaning in a way. Now, if we look at this, the loop doesn't actually end here, but um, this curly brace, which is now uh, starting a block, actually ends somewhere very far down, and that is here. So this whole thing uh, is starting here. Now, there is this here. I don't know what that is for. So it's commented out. It says G open edge DDR5. I don't know. It also says orbit CFG something. So we were, um, w when we did some initial research, 
uh, we were looking at uh, you know what the uh, different parts in the SOC actually are and we uh, we actually saw that in the manual which was really interesting so they were writing that the uh, DDR part is coming from a vendor named Denali and Denali has something called orbit something uh, for the DDR part so yeah that's where this orbit thing comes from um, now what I want to do first is I want to get rid of some clutter here so that part and also this part here uh, they're not really necessary for us right now um, so we can just remove them I don't even know what they are and it looks like there is something for like simulation maybe so there is like sim pi sim phy I don't know but it's for like register configuration and let's have a quick look if we actually have those files so it's uh, supposedly in here oh, look at that there we go so here we have these uh, files that could be included um, yeah it just looks a bit strange so it would be including C files uh, for some reason here they have uppercase here they have lowercase extensions um, and it it's actually header files but for some reason they also have this .c extension it's a bit weird uh, and we, if we look at that um, that is something I told you earlier right so sometimes you look into DRAM and netcode that is supplied by a vendor and it's just writing tons of random data into random registers which are really not documented and if we just scroll down here uh, you know we get like I don't know a few hundreds of those uh, but they're not even used it's just I don't know what they are for even yeah so there is this here DDR training so I guess the above here is for doing the training or initializing it or something or initiating and then they probably noted down some values and then included them in another uh, file again or something I don't know really um, yeah so if we I think we looked at the phi if we look at the pi thing here now it should be very very similar right so yeah it's uh, here you also see the vendor name Denali right but it's just tons tons and tons of these yeah it's like 392 uh, of these rights here doing all the same well, let's say 350 maybe removing the or neglecting the uh, header here yeah, it's, it's a bit strange. So uh, ideally, we could also do DRAM training uh, when we just boot up the SOC. Oh, and hello, uh, Mingus dude. This is great. Yeah, thank you for the comment. It is great indeed, writing uh, random values to registers. <laughs> yep. So I guess it would be just very similar if we look at this here. Um, that's actually very interesting. So here it's like DDR4. 1066 13 whatever uh, and here it's 1600 something hang on what did we have 2133 um, yeah it's it's a bit confusing which of these is actually used and if we if we scroll down or up again um, right so here we had 2133 2800 3200 um that is something entirely different again i don't know it's it's a bit confusing there is also a bit of a subdirectory actually there is this here memory let's make this a bit larger so here it's like three two hundred that matches with that but we have two one three three so we're actually not really here but it's like there is the subdirectory and that again looks similar to that thing again Oh wow. And oh look, here we actually have two eight hundred and three two hundred. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with all of this stuff to be honest. Um and that is mostly actually because there is uh you know not very really open documentation on this. So it's uh if you're not working in that space, you actually never really get the chance to understand anything. And if you do work in that space, usually you would work under an NDA, and so you're not even allowed to talk about that. So that's how we do not ever get public knowledge of it, um, you know, except for 
you know, when, uh, I don't know, people are uh, very friendly and, you know, they help you out and stuff. Um, but yeah, this year is like uh, a bit awkward. Maybe this year is where we find the 2133. So this year is 2800, 3200. I would guess so. It doesn't have it here in the name. Um, yeah. And I don't know which of these. Uh, lots of, you, you see, it's like tons of register rights again. Like all sorts of random stuff. There is even a to-do here. Um, so it looks like they were not even fully done. Also, lots of... Uh, uh, like some some register rights are even commented out here just like on this side actually um yeah it's it's a bit strange so yeah i, I think the supply chain when it comes to like dram parts is a bit um uh let's say a, a bit different from what we're used to in uh, open source development anyway so yeah uh Back to this year, so I really just want to get rid of everything, um, which is currently just uh, you know blocking our understanding of the actual execution flow that is currently going on. So I would, you know, I would just remove everything uh, which is not applicable for us, like this stuff, for example, and this stuff, and this year. So we can still restore it at some point. I just want to have a clear view of the execution flow here. Uh, so we also remove that thing. And we can also remove this here. Right. Oh, look, they, <laughs> they even had that here. Print F L E D. I don't know what they did there. Um, it could be that when they didn't get the uh, the serial to work, they were using an LED for doing some prints in a way. Maybe Morse code. I don't know. It just looks funny. If we if we search for that printf LED, do we even find it somewhere? Like, yeah, it's it's only in the boot main file. And it just looks funny though. Sometimes these um. Code fragment, uh, uh, fragments are telling you a bit um, about the development process. So here is some unnecessary comment. Um, if one, while one, does not really make sense for us. Okay, what else do we have? What does this, what does this here belong to? And, who formatted that code anyway? Um, so here, once again, this here, that is this block here, config ddr phi, whatever. Um, let's just put another comment here uh, for like, and Uh, now, now we got this loop here. So this is now for writing a test pattern. So if you look at this here, um, it's, it's writing some values to some addresses. So write L is just, you know, writing a long value um, and it's writing this pattern to that register, hex one, whatever. And it looks like, uh, no, that looks a bit different from this here. I don't know. Um, yeah, but, but you see, it's like uh, this here is now part of the uh, loop iterator. So we have I++, right? So this here is counting like, you know, in, in, in steps of four. So yeah, it's like uh, along would be four bytes, right? So this is like uh, writing chunks of four bytes each or uh, 64 bits each. So yeah, along is like 64 bits. Um, and then it's trying to read that back. And if it doesn't read the same value again, so this is the value we're writing. We write that to DRAM, then we read it back. And if it doesn't fit, it would say, hey, there is an error here. So something went wrong in the DRAM setup. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't have a co uh, code formatter configured right now. So let's just um, do this a bit in a manual fashion. Uh, like like this here, I don't know. 
Let's indent with uh, no four spaces. Uh, there is also C programmers who really don't like spaces. Um, I do like spaces to make things a bit more readable. So yeah, like four four is not a function call, but if you don't have a like if you don't have the space here, it looks a bit like a function call. However, it's not a function call, right? Uh, <laughs> So yeah, and they have this here, fail flag. It's like also something used in C. So it's like, you know, you save a temporary value somewhere uh, before you return with an error or something. Um, so in, in Rust, we uh, have some nicer tools for achieving that actually. Um, and yeah, it doesn't really matter too much right now. Uh, yeah, this here is really just for making things readable. That's all. Uh, you can see also there there are like some tabs here. I know I don't even have a setup for that either, um, and I don't really care right now. It's it's also like mixed tabs and whatnot. Yeah, but this here is really very very straightforward. So this is really just writing some patterns to memory, reading them back, and then checking. So if if we look at this here. Um, that could actually be like helper functions for that because it's, it's always doing the same thing, writing to some address, reading it back and then checking again. It's just that it's writing to like, is it even different offsets or something? It looks like it's all the same. So you could also do that three times in a loop. So this is where it would actually make sense to have a loop. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a bit weird. Oh, look, ah, they're actually writing three different patterns. So this here is an all zero pattern. This is a 5A, 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 5A. And this here is A5, 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 A5. So yeah, if you want to make that a function, this is the only parameter you have. And that's it. Uh, well, and, and maybe this here. Yeah. Oh, well. And it looks like we're doing the same thing again. So here we're now using an all F pattern or, you know, it's just, if you look at the uh, corresponding bit mask, it would be like all ones. Yeah, I, I hate tabs, by the way. They are really like cluttering things, especially when they are mixed with uh, spaces. And yeah, I know that there are people discussing like, hey, should we use tabs or spaces? Um, yeah, there are some arguments as to which are more accessible or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so now this here should be the end of the loop. Right, that's it. So. This here is just the DRAM test with four different patterns. So there is like A5, 5A, 00, and FF, and so on. Uh, that's just the abbreviation of this year, this year, this year, and that year. And now this year, It's just printing the progress. So uh, it's just saying if your iterator value, and so this here is like, that's the operand, the operator, the second operand. Um, so it's saying if it's modulo something uh, equivalent to zero, um, then it's printing like, hey, we're at this stage now. So that is what we see here. Uh, I don't know what the, 1m or 2m well it's like this here is like 256k um and we're iterating in steps of like 64 bits each so if we go like this is our favorite calculator which is node.js um if we go like 64 by 
a 56k. So yeah, this is like um, 16 uh, million, right? Or 16 megabits each. And 16 megabits is two megabytes, right? Uh, or is it? And I always get lost a bit in that. Anyway, it's just printing progress anyway. It doesn't really matter too much right now. Um, I mean, you, you could also uh, choose like a smaller or a larger value, um, just, you know, so that you get quicker feedback. And yeah, it's also the same thing that we do for the D1 SOC in our boot. So we don't even need this part. So all we actually need is everything up here. So the below part was really just the test. So we just need to translate all of this here into REST code. And that's not even much if you look at that. It just gets a bit more because we have these um, macros like that one and those here, so they would expand a bit. Um, but that is actually very, very feasible to do. Now there is one or two function calls maybe, which are a bit more extensive. Um, so I want to quickly look at that. Let's, yeah, let's just format that also a bit nicer. Uh, indentation. So here it's saying the RC clock. So the DRAM controller clock is 12.5 M megahertz, I guess. So yeah, could also be formatted like this. Um, I don't know if that refers to DDR num being zero or something. It doesn't really make sense to me, to be honest. Uh, could also be that it's just like whatever is hard coded in here in that macro. I have no idea. Anyway, um, yeah, let's let's keep it like that. Well, let's maybe put that in this line actually, and then change it into sorry into this here. So, yeah, releasing the DLL reset. Okay. So I guess we have something similar to, what the heck is this here? So it's zero plus zero shifted, but that doesn't even make sense to me. It's just zero. <laughs> Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. So you could just write this here. It's, it's like a no op. I mean, tell me if this here is something non-zero, but I will use our favorite editor again, uh, which is Node.js, and then see what comes out of this equation. And Node.js says it's zero. So we're adding a fixed zero to the base address, which means we just have the base address. I don't know, it's, it's a bit weird. Yeah, this here, this here is what I wanted to look at, orbit boot. So what does orbit boot actually do? I hope this is not a large function that we would also need to translate because that would mean that um, everything else here, which looks like it's just writing to a very few registers, is uh, really just some minimal overhead compared to this giant thing. So where does orbit orbit boot come from? It sounds a bit like orbit, but yeah, really no affiliation there. Uh oh, and that is assembly code. But this is from from a build step, so yeah, it's not like it's not like precompiled code or something. Oh wow. So we have different definitions of orbit boot. Okay. Oh, look, and here in the uh, make file. Ah, this is actually, uh, we can now see which of those are used. So orbit, orbit, orbit. Uh-huh. Ah. So if DDR speed is 2133, uh, that is this year, right? And that's what we have, 2133. 
So 2133 means it's including this file. And can it be that this is just like the 1066 is just half of 2133? Just like 800 is half of 1600 or, okay, this here is roughly half of that. I don't know, it's, it's a bit weird, but here it would fit again. I don't really know. So if anybody is uh, really um, <laughs> in the know of DRAM, tell me. Uh, looks like an inline register number, which happens to be zero. Uh, it might make sense semantically to have a defined for the register offset and name, but an inline zero is indeed nonsense, right, uh, JN? Yeah, so it's like um, often this, this sort of code here is like generated code, right? And with generated code, uh, you know, you get like lots of boilerplate. Also like what we, um, like all those helper functions for reading, changing and writing back uh, values for registers. That's also like, it looks very much like generated code. Um, it's not even meant for uh, being human readable. Um, it's, it's just the way it is. Uh, it, it could also be written more efficiently, but it doesn't really matter for like, you know, when you generate and then compile code again, you know, nobody <laughs> actually really needs to read that. Um, yeah, that's true. Anyway, so now to find our orbit boot, um, we need to look at this file now. So in the uh, DDRC, DDRC is uh, here. I'm sorry for the uh, odd character. So uh, I, I just did a new Vim setup recently. Um, and I guess the font isn't yet properly set up. But otherwise, I'm actually quite happy with that. Um, so we're looking at 1066 this year. Oh, look, it's even called orbit boot. So there we go. Oh, huh, look at that. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. This is so beautiful. I'm, I'm just scrolling down. It's, it's writing like 500 registers with random values <laughs> or 300. I don't know. So where it says APB, right? Um, that is also just a helper somehow to write to some register. Uh, I don't even know why it's called APB, right? It could also be write L, probably. Beautiful. Oh, look here. We actually do have runtime DRAM training. And we even do have some comments. Oh, look here. We also have like DDRC clock. Uh, we have another DDRC clock. Which is interesting. So it's like uh, judge frequency change request type. Okay. So yeah, DRAM. It's it's sort of uh, complicated. So compared to everything else, we need to initialize DRAM. Really, is the hardest part. So yeah, uh, JN writes APB is the AMBA peripheral bus or something. Yeah, exactly. It's coming from ARM. Yep. Yeah. So. I think we actually looked at that at some point, but we can also quickly look. Ember ARM APB. So yeah, we also found this here. So Ember APB protocol specification, version C, uh, advanced peripheral bus is APB, right? It's coming from the advanced microcontroller bus architecture. Yep, exactly. Yeah, we'll also put that here in the notes later. Thank you uh, for the reminder. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I guess we should actually look at the APB write and read functions. And I guess they come from sys.h, maybe? Could be. Where, where is sys.h? Uh, do we have something like include? Do we have something like sys? Do we have common sys.h? No. Oh, well, um, RG. I actually have telescope set up here now, uh, which would be really cool. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how it works yet. So let's see where this is defined. Uh, I mean, it's used in a ton of places. Do we search for something like void? Void inline APB, right? Um, Oh, wow. There is also something from Kate. Ah, that's the, ah, look. It looks like the uh, SPI part is coming from Cadence. Also interesting. 
I guess we also saw that in the data sheet at some point, or the manual. But we don't actually have a full manual, so it's really just like a fraction of a manual. Um, yeah, I don't know where that would be defined, but it would be a necessary thing to also implement for us. So if we want to write to these APB things, uh, we actually need to have that. So yeah, let's look at the uh, directory here again. So in, in this common directory, that's where I would expect that to be. Oh, it's actually RG or APB write in common. And here we go. It's in comdef, in common definitions. So APB write is again a macro. And that macro is Oh dear, too stupid to write. Um, right, it's doing this here. Volatile, unsigned, in whatever, adder, data. That looks to me really just like writing to a register. Huh. Well, um, <laughs> and we don't actually need a special definition for it, right? Or does anyone spot anything special about this? I mean, it's it's writing a 32-bit value. Okay. So it's just like write L, essentially. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, in, a, in a similar fashion here, uh, when we just read a value. So here, in, instead of writing, we're returning. Yeah. Just looks a bit fancy with all the parentheses. Looks like looks even like some of those aren't even necessary, but yeah, they are. Looks a bit like closure code. Um, <laughs> funny. Anyway, so we will just use write. Uh, well, in, in Rust, it's like um, write volatile and read volatile for reading, but we just need to write values. OMC secure APB base adder. I don't know what OMC is, but it could be like orbit, orbit memory controller, maybe. I don't know what would make something secure here because that doesn't look like it's got anything to do with security. And if so, um, what is the meaning of that? I don't know. Uh, but it's probably a different base address from that thing here. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So again, some more um, code coming it out, like some reset the assert. Yeah, but it, it's really just mostly writing tons of registers, doing some logic and then tons of registers again. Oh, but here in this case, okay, let's actually start reading again. So it starts with reading and here it's reading something else again. And then it's writing back the value that we read before, but it's slightly modified, right? So yeah, this is a typical read, write, modify. And here, this is also interesting. We're seeing a read, but no modification. So one could think, one could think um, that this here is necessary, um, but I've seen this where, um, and we actually had that here uh, where we, could not continue with our execution um, unless we were actually reading a value before. So if we were not reading a value, um, then so something just didn't work. So it's just by doing a read access to register, you're sort of unlocking something. Um, yeah, that's how hardware works. So <laughs> doing a read some somehow changes the state of the system, even though Intuitively, it doesn't really sound like it, right? So yeah, that's very interesting. Now, um, I don't actually want to uh, bore people here in the stream by you know just copying around all of that stuff here and translating it. So what I really wanted to do is I just wanted to walk through everything that we have here that would be really necessary for us to do and see if it's feasible to translate that. And so if we just take this here, um, we can translate most of that code here to Rust in a very straightforward manner, right? So um, we could even 
do like uh, our own definition of APB, right? We could just, I don't know, make it an alias of uh, the right L function or the right volatile function, our case, and then just make small adjustments here. So like, for example, instead of tilde uh, in Rust, we're using uh, the bang, like the um, exclamation mark character uh, for, you know, in inverting a value. Um, and that's about it. So the, yeah, the only interesting two parts is really just, I don't know, resolving this loop here a bit maybe. Um, I mean, this here on the right hand side that could be like, we just make it a function, we give it two parameters. So like, I don't know, the base address and something else maybe. And then it will be very straightforward to do. Uh, and then this here, that is also something that we can just very, very straightforward and easily translate to Rust. Um, all those macros are probably really just, you know, like write, uh, read something, write back something, uh, some modified value should also be very straightforward. And now this loop up here is also very, very similar again. So it's just a while loop, um, while temp and blah, blah, blah two is not zero. Um, yeah, so so temp is just reading from some register. Ah, here we actually see this thing where, you know, we, we have some offset and something. So yeah, we're also doing like zero plus something. So zero plus, like also nonsense, doesn't really make any sense, but it's one shifted by two. So that part still makes sense so that you can see, okay, it's actually, um, we're uh, accessing the second bit here uh, and the register. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but no, it's actually, uh, uh, we're, we're adding that to the base adder. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're accessing uh, a, a few registers later. So it's like uh, two registers further or, or two addresses further. Yep, yep. So, yeah, um, that shall be it for today, actually. So, yeah, we haven't written any Rust code today, um, but we have the strategy now. So uh, what I will do now is I will just, you know, I'll take all of these macros. I will just refactor a few more things um, and then rewrite everything in Rust, as you should, because the NSA tells you to. Not, not a joke. Uh, they actually uh, <laughs> had a post recently and um, they were, uh, you know, urging uh, software vendors to please use memory safe languages uh, or at least uh, use like lots of tools like, um, you know, a compiler flex and something to eradicate those uh, memory safety issues because apparently uh, as per some Microsoft study, it's like 70% of uh, all the issues are memory safety issues. So yeah. Um, just another announcement. So uh, another announcement next week, I will not be here. So I will take a week off again. Uh, so I will see you again in two weeks. Um, and I hope until then I can already uh, actually show you something. Um, so as, as you see, it's, it's mostly straightforward. So it's just a matter of, uh, you know, getting the translation, right? Um, yeah, and then we should see, uh, you know, if we can just continue with um, our uh, next part in the initialization, which would then be Rust SBI. But yeah, we will see. So with that, um, have a very great evening. Thank you very much and see you next time. Bye.